Good morning, everyone. Sorry about uh, the delay in starting today. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties on our end, but we are ready to go and hope you are too. Now, before we start, my name is Sarah. I work in the education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, and I'm so excited to join you today for another day of Aquarium Online Academy because we get to talk about one of my favorite subjects to talk about. We're going to talk about tide pools. Now, you may be familiar with tide pools and that habitat or that place where animals live, or it might be a brand habitat you've never heard about before. And we're going to explore what a tide pool is and then look at some of the animals that live there. Now, while we're exploring, we would love to hear from you. And I'm not alone here in the studio. I have a lot of help. I have my friend Cynthia, and she's doing a lot of things. She's controlling what you see behind me, and she's also going to take your questions if you have any questions or observations or thoughts you would like to share. Now, the way that you can share with us is using this text line that Cynthia put up for you. Now, that number is 562-286-1838. So feel free to text us any questions, any thoughts or observations that you'd like to share about tide pools today. Now, if you're watching live, so it is... 910 on October 13th, you can go ahead and text us. If it's after we're done airing live, we would still love to hear from you, but we ask that you email us. And that email address is right below that phone number. It's live at lbaop.org. So we still want to hear from you, but we're just not always manning that text line if we're not live anymore. All right, everyone, are you ready to start exploring? Now we're going to be explorers today, and we are going to explore this habitat tide pool. So I'm going to step off the screen. And I'm going to have Cynthia put up a picture of a tide pool, and we're going to start by making some observations about this habitat. Now, we say that word habitat a lot, and a habitat is where animals live. And there's lots of things that make up a habitat. It's not only the animal, but it could be other animals that live with that animal. And it can also be non-living things, like you might find some non-living things here that make up the habitat for a tide pool. So what do you notice about this habitat? What kinds of things do you see? Hmm, I definitely notice a lot of rocks. And rocks are really important for a tide pool because that basically makes up what is going to create the pool. Now, if we break this word down, tide pool, into two parts, we have tide and we have pool. Now, I mentioned pool, right? The rocks right here, they're going to create the pool, right? They're going to create sort of like a container that's going to hold the water to make a pool. If you think of a swimming pool, you've got a big concrete space and water's full inside, and that is the pool. But in our tide pool, it's gonna be the rocks that we saw right along the beach that create that pool. Let's take another look at a picture. Here we go, perfect. So you can see how these rocks create all these spaces here for water. And that's like a little pool for a lot of animals. But then we've got the first part of that word, tide. Now that word's maybe a little bit more complicated. You may have heard it before. A lot of times we associate it with tide, like cleaning detergent for your laundry. A little bit different. The tides here are the changing of the water. So it's the water movement. Now tides in our ocean are connected to the moon. It's the gravitational pull. And we have two high tides a day and two low tides a day. So the tide changes about four times a day. Now, if you were to look at this picture and you would just take a wild guess, do you think this would be a picture of high tide or a picture of low tide? I'm gonna have Cynthia put up that number again and I'll give you about a minute or so to go ahead and text us in. What do you think? Do you think this is high tide or do you think this would be low tide? What do you think? Now let's see, what can we see here? Maybe there are some clues that can help us determine if it's high tide or if it's low tide. I mean, I definitely see the water, right? We see some water here and then here and all the way out here, lots of water for the ocean. And then there's lots of rocks too, right? Now, we see some rocks that are hidden here in the water, but I also see all these rocks here. Hmm. Now, could that be a clue to tell us if this is high tide or low tide? What do you think? That's right. If you all guess this is low tide, you're right. So low tide is when a lot of the rocks are exposed. So we can tell this is low tide because even though there are some rocks under the water here, all these rocks here are completely exposed. Miss June? Miss June's class. Thanks so much for texting us in. And you all said low tide as well. Excellent job. You're correct. Now we can see all those rocks and that gives us a hint that it's low tide. If the, those rocks, all these big rocks here, were all covered up by the water, that would tell us it's high tide. So when the tide goes out and we have a low tide, water gets caught in those spaces on the rocks. And that's what creates the pools for animals to live in. Now, the tide pools, 
like I said, are one of my favorite habitats. And one of the reasons is it's an easy habitat for us to go explore. Now, we have tide pools all along our coast here in Southern California, and a lot of coastal areas, not just in California, have tide pools, and they're really easy to access. You can walk right from the beach onto those rocks and explore those animals. So it's a super fun place to explore. But think about what it's like to live in the tide pools for those animals. It's one of the most challenging places. Take a look. Here is the movement of the water. So the tide pools can actually be one of the most challenging habitats in the ocean for animals to live in. Even though it's shallow, even though it's super easy for us to access, this habitat has constantly moving water. So not only is the water level changing, so animals can be exposed out of the water to the sun or other elements, but think about those waves. These animals are getting crashed on by these waves all day long, constantly. So the animals that live in the tide pools, they have some pretty amazing adaptations. Have you heard that word before? If you've tuned into any Aquarium Online Academy program, you've probably heard us talk about adaptations before. We talk about it a lot. But adaptations are actually really amazing. So what an adaptation is, is it's something on an animal's body that's going to help it live in its habitat. So if we think about the tide pools like this habitat here, the animals who live here, they might be small. They might not look like they do a lot, but they have some incredible adaptations because they're able to survive that super challenging habitat. So now we're going to dive in and take a look at some tide pool animals and explore their amazing adaptations. Now I'm going to leave this image up, or I'm going to have Cynthia leave this image up for a moment. And go ahead and text us if you recognize any of these animals. And then we can talk about the animals that you want to talk about. Now I definitely have my favorite tide pool animals. But if you want to talk about a specific animal that you see in this image, go ahead and text us in or just make some observations. Now, this tide pool is very easy to see the animals. This is actually here at our aquarium in one of our exhibits. We call it our coastal corner, but it's recreating a tide pool habitat. So all these animals that you see here, we could just as easily see them out in the open ocean in their natural tide pool habitat. So you can see back here, like here in this open space up here, over here, we've got a lot of rocks. And then there's even some small little rocks right here. And then all these animals are living on those rocks just as they would in a natural tide pool habitat. Now what's cool about tide pools is they can be lots of different colors, as you can see here. I can see lots of colors. I see orange, I see pink, I see blue, I see purple, I see yellow. Any other colors? I see white and gray from the rocks. So many different colors we'll see in a tide pool. All right, well, you're texting in your favorite animal. I'm going to go ahead and start with my favorite animal in here that maybe you didn't recognize or you didn't notice is hanging out here in the corner, and it's right here. Did you notice this one? It almost looks like it's a shadow or just kind of like a blob. That is actually a sea cucumber. You heard that right. There's an animal in the ocean called a sea cucumber. There's a picture of a sea cucumber. Now, this is an invertebrate. So an animal with no backbones, as most of the animals, not all, but most of the animals we find in a tide pool, they are invertebrates. They have no bones in their body, which actually helps them live in this tide pool habitat that when they're getting jostled around a lot, being soft and flexible can help protect you from those moving waves. Take a look at this sea cucumber. This one is actually called a warty sea cucumber, but this is one that we often find right here in our local tide pool habitats. Now, sea cucumbers. When you look at this animal, it looks pretty spiky, right? Right, we can see there's like a spike here, and a spike here, and here, and over here, and then there's another one over there. So those spikes are actually one of the sea cucumber's adaptations. Because if you're looking for a snack, and you're kind of moseying around the tide pools, and you see this thing over there, and it looks kind of like a spiky ball, do you think you want to eat that? I wouldn't want to get those spikes in my mouth. That could hurt, right? So this sea cucumber can stay safe by having those spikes. But I'm going to let you in on a little bit of a secret. The sea cucumber, even though it kind of looks like a blob, is a trickster. You heard that. It's a trickster. Because if we were to touch those spikes, they're actually going to feel really soft. So its whole body, including those spikes, are soft and squishy. So they're kind of like false spikes. So it makes you think that it's spiky. But if you were to really get close to it, it wouldn't hurt you at all. So it first way, the first way that it protects itself or its first adaptation is pretending that it's really spiky. 
Now, if you are not fooled by those spikes and you get closer to the sea cucumber, they do something very weird with their body. Are you ready for it? They do something called evisceration. Now, that's a really big fancy word. But what evisceration really means is it means they, they spit out their guts. That's right. They spit out their guts. So if you are not fooled by those spikes and you get closer to that sea cucumber and the sea cucumber gets scared, they're going to take their stomach and all their insides and they're going to spit it out. And they hope that by them spitting out their stomach, you get scared or you get distracted and you eat their stomach and then the sea cucumber can slowly move away. Isn't that weird? But it's so cool. So that's another adaptation that the sea cucumber has to stay safe in its habitat, is it can spit out its guts, distract a predator, and then it can get away. Pretty cool. Now the sea cucumber, it's pretty small. This one's only about this big. We have this one here at the aquarium in our touch pool. They also have suction cups. Now we can all say that word together, suction cups. And suction cups are a very common adaptation in the tide pool and in the ocean. And suction cups are basically sticky feet. And you can see them down here. All these little white things, I kind of think sometimes they look like macaroni noodles. They are all right here. And those suction cups use water to stick onto surfaces and hold on really tight. Here we got another picture of a sea cucumber. And so those suction cups help the animal to hold on. So if those waves come crashing over it, they can hold on really tight and they won't get pushed away. Excellent. I see Miss Chun's class uh, texted in some other animals they saw. So let's, excellent. Let's go back to this picture. And Miss Chun's class, you notice sea urchins, starfish, sea anemones, and clams. Excellent observations. Now, just a moment, word on the clams. We definitely find clams in tidal habitats. But you might notice something interesting about the clams that we see here. They're open. So the clams that we have in here are actually food that we're feeding most of these other animals, mainly the sea stars, but some of the other animals might eat some of those clams as well. And so you will find clams, but ours here in the tide pool, they are there for food for our other animals. All right. Now we're going to talk about a sea urchin next because we talked about being spiky and sea urchins, they are some of the spikiest, if not the spikiest animal you'll find in a tide pool. Now the sea cucumber, they had false spikes, right? I said they were soft and squishy, and if you pet them, they aren't hard at all. Sea urchin, it's a little bit of a different story. Now, sea urchins here in, in Southern California, they are safe to touch. We have them in our touch pools, and if you go to a tide pool, as long as you're gentle, with one or two fingers, you can touch them as long as you're not smashing your hand on them. But if you're an animal and you're looking for something to eat, do you think you'd want to bite into an animal like a sea urchin? Probably not, because it is so spiky. And those spikes covering its whole body are the sea urchin's adaptation. They help it stay safe because they deter. They keep predators away because not very many animals want to deal with all those spikes. Now, something interesting, the sea urchin also has suction cups, just like the sea cucumber. Now, this animal here does not look anything like that sea cucumber. Or even, oh, here we go. We can see all its suction cups. So they have them sticking up all around here. Look at that. Can you imagine waving some sticky hands? You can wave them like a sea urchin. So they use those suction cups to move, but also up here, they use them to grab a hold. Can't see my hands. Could grab a hold of some things to eat, like kelp. So you can see down here, it's kind of hard to see, but over here is a piece of kelp. And that is what sea urchins love to eat. And so having their suction cups up at the top or in all directions, they can catch pieces of kelp that are flying by to have as a snack. Now I was gonna say that the sea urchins, they don't really look like a sea cucumber even though they both have spikes. And they don't look like the sea star that they were living next to in the tide pool. But believe it or not, these three animals are related. They are in a group that we call echinoderms, which I know sounds like a fancy word. We can say that word together, echinoderms. But what echinoderms really mean is spiny skin. Do you think that's an accurate description for the sea urchin, for the sea cucumber, and even some sea stars? Look at that, spiny skin. And so those spiny skin animals either use their spines for protection or to make animals think they're spiky, which also helps them with protection. So that is our sea urchin. Now let's go on to another animal that Miss Chun's class noticed. Let's go back to our coastal corner for a moment. And Miss Chun's class noticed some sea stars or starfish. Either term works. Now we do like to call them sea stars because to be a fish, there are three things you need on your body. Gills, fins, and scales. 
Do you think our sea stars have those three things? Nope, they don't. But totally fine to call them starfish. Sea stars, starfish, pretty interchangeable. But there are lots of types of sea stars living here in this tide pool. And sea stars, they can come in different colors and shapes and textures. But remember, they are related to those sea urchins and those sea cucumbers because they are spiny skinned animals. So if you take a look at this, oh, this one right here, or this sea star right here, or even this one over here, you can kind of tell they're textured. They have bumps on their body. And those bumps are actually spikes. And some of them even have little pinchers in them. So these sea stars can actually catch little things that are drifting by them with those little tiny pinchers. Now let's take a closer look at a sea star. Any sea star, I'll let Cynthia pick one. Aha, bat stars. So this is a different kind of sea star. These ones are called bat stars. Now you might notice, unlike those other stars that had the really long arm, these bat stars have kind of shorter arms. And they get their name from this webbing that's between their arms. So their arms aren't as defined as some of those other sea stars. It kind of looks like they have webbing or wings between their arms. And that's how they get their name of bat star, kind of like the animal of a bat. Now bat stars, we see them in all different colors. But it's interesting, we don't really know why they're all these different colors. Because these sea stars all live together, they all eat the same things, but they just turn into different colors. Now, sea stars, as we generally picture them, have how many arms? What do you think? Should we count? Let's take this orange one in the middle. Let's count how many arms this one has. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. Five arms. You can hold up your hand. You've got your sea star right there. Five arms. And that's true for most sea stars. But I'm going to give you a minute to take a look at this picture. Do you notice any sea stars that maybe have more or less arms? It happens sometimes. We find sea stars that have more or less arms than five. If you spotted this pink one over here, check it out. One, two, three, four, five, six. So every so often we'll see bat stars with six arms or even four arms. And then sometimes you might find a star that is meant to have more arms. We have a sea star in the ocean called the sunflower star. Now we're looking at the bottom side of this sunflower star. And this sunflower star is going to live a little bit deeper than those other sea stars we saw. So even though they are part of a tide pool, there's different levels in the tide pool. So there's sort of the more shallow pools, and then there can be lower tidal zones. And so you'd find the bigger sea stars in those lower tidal zones. But this sunflower star can have up to 23 arms. Can you believe that? 23 arms. And take a look at all of these suction cups. All of those tiny little things help it stick on and hold on really tight in its habitat so that it can't get taken off a rock. It won't get removed from its home. No predator will be able to grab it because it can hold on so nice and tight. Now these suction cups, they're not only used for holding on, they serve another purpose. They can do something else and it's really cool. So when a sea star is using its suction cups and moving around, it is actually sniffing. Watch this sea star move. So it's moving, but it's also smelling. So sea stars have this cool ability. They can smell with their feet. Can you smell with your feet? I can't smell with my feet. Now you might be able to smell your feet sometimes. You might have stinky feet, but we don't smell with our feet. But sea stars, they will use all those suction cut feet to smell for their food. Now we mentioned before that sea stars might eat clams. They might eat mussels. Sometimes we'll even feed our sea stars pieces of fish. So sea stars smell and find their food by using those suction cup feet. Now I know that's pretty amazing. Sea stars have five arms. They can have up to 23 arms. They come in all different shapes and colors. They might have pinchers on their body. They have suction cup feet they can use to hold on and smell things. But sea stars can do even more incredible things. Let's talk about how a sea star eats. So we know what it eats, right? We know it eats clams or mussels. We know that it uses its suction cup feet to smell for its food. But take a look at this star. There's not a ton to it. It's pretty thin. So how do you think it might eat? Hmm. Well, it eats in a really interesting way. Now, I know we have a picture of what's called a chocolate chip sea star. I know it sounds pretty tasty, right? A chocolate chip sea star up on the glass. And you can see its stomach. So this sea star right here is eating. And what you're seeing is this sea star, when they're ready to eat, they actually pull their stomach up out of their body to eat their food. Now, it's not like the sea cucumber that spits out its stomach and leaves it behind. It's still attached to its body. 
But if a sea star is going to eat a muscle, it's going to smell for the muscle, it's going to find that muscle, and then it's going to give the muscle a big hug. Do you hug your food before you eat it? We'd get it all over our clothes if we tried to do that, right? But a sea star is going to hug that muscle or clam, take all their suction cups and hold on, and then pull it open. And once they get it open, there's a squishy animal on the inside, and they're ready to eat it. So what they do is they pull out their stomach, and they stuff it into that muscle or clam shell, and then their stomach has acid on it, which your stomach has in it that helps break down your food. So it breaks down the muscle, and then it pulls its stomach back into its body. Can you imagine doing that at lunch today? You open your lunchbox, you pull out your stomach, you stuff it into your lunchbox, close it, shake it up, and then open it and eat it up again? No, that would make a huge mess. But that is how our sea stars eat, is they have to remove their stomach from their body, digest their food, and then pull it back into their body. Pretty fascinating, right? Now, these animals in the tide pool, I could talk on and on and on, but we are actually already out of time that went by so fast. I'm going to have Cynthia put back up one of our tide pool images. Ah, uh, the tide pool's at sunset. So just kind of to recap what we talked about, we talked about what makes a tide pool, right? We have rocks that create these pools, and the water, the tide goes in and out leaving homes for these animals. And then we talked about some amazing adaptations that the animals who live in this challenging habitat have to help them survive. We talked about a sea cucumber and how they have fake spikes and they can spit out their guts and they use suction cups to hold on. We talked about the sea urchin that has real spikes to protect itself and it also has suction cups. And then we talked about the fascinating sea star and all of its arms and sticky feet and how it spits out its stomach to eat. Well, everyone, I hope you had a good time learning a little bit about some of the animals that live in the tide pool, and I hope you continue, continue your exploration of this fascinating habitat. If there's any last-minute questions, go ahead and text us or email us. We'd love to hear from you. And join us at 10 o'clock for another program coming up. It's going to be led by Cynthia, all in Spanish, and I believe it's about mammals and conservation. So it should be a really interesting, uh, wonderful program. Oh, and one more thing. If you're a teacher watching, we would love to hear how many students you have watching with us. That just helps us better serve our community. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.